Hello, my name is Tanya Dorr. I'm a medical oncologist and professor in the Department of Medical Oncology and Therapeutics Research, as well as section chief for the Genitourinary Cancers Program at City of Hope near Los Angeles in California. While the end result of either agent, a GnRH agonist or antagonist, is castrate level of testosterone, these two classes of drugs actually work by a different mechanism of action. They are both working on the pituitary gonadal axis, but the GnRH agonist actually stimulates this axis. So what happens first is there's an increase in FSH and LH, which then tells the testicle to produce more testosterone. And so there's what we call a flare uh, or an increased level of testosterone. This then sets off a negative feedback loop and there's down regulation of the pituitary gonadal axis so that eventually there is uh, a decrease in testosterone production. On the other hand, the GnRH antagonists simply shut down testicular production by negatively regulating the entire axis. So there is no increase in FSH and LH and no initial increase in testosterone. So what does this mean clinically? First of all, uh, we expect that the testosterone levels will go down more quickly and we don't need to block the potential negative consequences of a testosterone flare by running in an androgen receptor antagonist which we need to do with the GnRH agonists, uh, since that initial surge of testosterone can stimulate prostate cancer growth. So in a patient who has metastatic disease, who's symptomatic, we don't want the cancer to have that little growth spurt from the testosterone surge. On the antagonist side, it can be safe to just use it directly without needing to do the androgen receptor blocking um, such as bicalutamide uh, run-in because there is no testosterone flare. There are other consequences of the FSH and LH surge as well. These are felt to potentially be implicated in cardiovascular complications from ADT. Although to be fair, the, the full mechanism of that has not been fully elucidated. Degarelix was the first GnRH antagonist that was approved. This was based on a phase three trial in which patients with really any stage of prostate cancer were randomly assigned to receive Degarelix or Luprolide. The primary endpoint was suppression of testosterone below 50, which is the traditional definition of castrate levels of testosterone. And this was measured from day 28 to the end of one year. Degarelix has a loading dose, so the first injection is 240 milligrams, and then it's a monthly 80 milligram sub-Q injection. Uh, they also studied a different dose that we no longer use. We use the 80 milligram monthly, not the 160. And then the Luprolide was administered in a monthly format at the 7.5 milligram dose. So you can see that the testosterone suppression below 50 at day between day 28 to day 364 was 97% with the currently approved dosing for Degarelix and 96.4% for Luprolide with the monthly depot formulation. Now, looking earlier uh, where we anticipate there's going to be a flare of testosterone with Luprolide, indeed, you see that at day three, none of the patients with Luprolide treatment had achieved castrate levels of testosterone, whereas with Degarelix, 96% already had suppression by day three. So this speaks to that difference in mechanism of action. Relugolix is now the FDA-approved oral uh, GnRH antagonist. So this was approved based on the phase three HERO study in which patients with, uh, again, some different stages of advanced prostate cancer were randomized to Relugolix or Luprolide. Um, in this case, the Relugolix also has a loading dose. Um, patients take the three tablets on the first day and then one a day after that. Um, they The primary endpoint was similar. It was sustained testosterone suppression uh, measured from day 29 through 48 weeks, so a similar time period. 
And you can see that with Relugolics, 96.7% had uh, testosterone suppression less than 50, whereas 88.8% on the Luprolide arm did. And the difference in that control arm may be due to the fact that here they used the three-month depot formulation, the 22.5 milligram Luprolide. If you look at an uh, earlier time point, uh, this case, uh, day four, 56% of patients on the Relugolix arm had already achieved castrate levels of testosterone by day four, compared to, again, zero on the Luprolide arm, which is what we would expect due to the flare. In terms of deeper testosterone suppression, so there's some data that 50 is not really an adequate amount of testosterone suppression, even though it's our classic definition of castration. If you look at how many patients achieved a testosterone less than 20 by day 15, it was 78.4% with Relugolix compared to 1% on the Luprolide arm. While the comparator arm for both Daguerrelix and Relugolix was Luprolide, similar results have been obtained in older studies for the other approved GnRH agonists, Gosarolin and Triptorolin. Regardless of how we lower testosterone, we see a similar uh, set of adverse effects uh, because it's that change from a high level of testosterone or normal level down to castrate that can provoke some of the adverse effects. And then there are also side effects that come from that sustained absence of testosterone. So things like hot flashes are very common across all of these agents. Uh, you can see 54% from the HERO trial of Relugolix, 26% in the Daguerrelix trial, uh, and 79% with Luprolide traditionally. There can also be weight gain. Uh, this was reported at 9% with the Daguerrelix study. Uh, there can be an increase in arthralgias. Um, this is not damage per se to joints, uh, but just sort of a less resilience. And so uh, wear and tear or, or degenerative changes over the years are already there, but patients might feel them a bit more once we suppress their testosterone. Fatigue can also be common or really manifesting, uh, in my experience, more as a reduction in stamina. So patients can do most activities that they want to do, but might be more tired at the end of it, or maybe can't go for quite as long or with the same intensity. So in the HERO trial, fatigue was reported at 26%, with the Luprolide trial, 15%. And then one of the major differences is in terms of how the injections are administered. Uh, so there are more injection site reactions with Daguerrelix. This is administered sub-Q, typically in the abdominal wall. Um, and there can be some erythema, um, some soreness, 35% uh, in the registrational trial. Luprolide, on the other hand, is, is administered intramuscular, uh, but there can still be some injection site reactions. Uh, traditionally, this is administered in the gluteus, which is a, a big muscle, um, but about 11% of patients will report injection site reactions. This has been a challenging question to answer. Uh, there have been some conflicting uh, studies using databases and uh, sort of claims analyses, but I think consensus is evolving to say that there is an increased risk of cardiovascular risk when we use castration therapy, period. There's a lot of interest in whether that amount of risk differs when we use an antagonist versus an agonist because of that difference in how the pituitary gonadal axis is manipulated and that flare of FSH and LH. So we can see that in the HERO study, which did look at this prospectively, uh, Relugolix had a 2.9% incidence of major adverse cardiac events in the entire population, whereas on the Luprolide arm, that was 6.2%. So that's about a 50% reduction, a hazard ratio of 0.46. They also prospectively designed in HERO to look at patients who had a prior history of major adverse cardiovascular events to see whether the rate was different in that population. 
And here we see that with ReLU Golix, it was 3.6% compared to 17.8% with Luprolide. So that's almost five times greater risk of these cardiovascular events with the LHRH agonist. Now, it's unclear what the mechanism of action is. We do know that castration impacts uh, blood pressure, insulin resistance, cholesterol, so many things that are risk factors for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. But there's also thoughts about the FSH uh, surge impacting cardiovascular function. And uh, there's some evidence preclinically that perhaps there's destabilization of pre-existing atherosclerotic plaques. Another concern that has arisen due to some epidemiologic or claims-based analyses is whether there's an increased risk of dementia in prostate cancer patients who receive androgen deprivation therapy. Uh, so this has been controversial. Um, there are always uh, some in, in inherent biases when we do these uh, database analyses. Uh, we can't get as granular at the data as we'd like. And our neurocognitive testing and our definitions uh, for diagnosing dementia also present additional challenges. That being said, when we look at electronic health records and diagnoses of dementia, Patients with prostate cancer who are treated with androgen deprivation do seem to have a higher incidence or diagnosis of dementia. So you can see it's 3% for all ADT uh, and 2% for patients who are, do not receive ADT, which ends up being a hazard ratio of 1.6. Is there a difference between GnRH agonists and antagonists um, when we try to separate that out? Uh, we do see perhaps a greater difference in the GnRH agonist group um, than antagonist. But I think overall, um, there is a need for good prospective studies um, and, of course, better tools to help us in diagnosing dementia. There can be reversible changes in memory when we treat our prostate cancer patients with ADT. Um, so some people will find a bit of short-term memory trouble, word-finding trouble, um, but I often do see in my practice that that can reverse once testosterone recovers, when we're done with a course of treatment. Um, but so this is something that we probably need to worry about most in our long-term uh, ADT patients, so patients with metastatic disease, for instance, who may be on castration therapy for you know, up to a decade or even longer in some cases. Thank you so much for watching this discussion about the efficacy and safety profiles of GnRH agonists and antagonists in patients with advanced prostate cancer. I hope you found it helpful. My name is Brenda Martone, and I'm a nurse practitioner at Northwestern Medicine in Chicago. We're going to be looking at overcoming disparities and barriers in prostate cancer. How can we give all patients the opportunity to access care? There is a perception that Black men experience more aggressive and lethal prostate cancer. And studies to support that there is a biological component to this, the data is limited. There was this meta-analysis of 47 studies evaluating the association of social determinants of health with prostate cancer, looking at overall survival in black and white patients with prostate cancer. Social determinants of health are, are things like age, comorbidities, insurance status, income, extent of disease, geography, the standardized treatments that we have, and insurance benefits. And what was very interesting about this meta-analysis of the these 47 studies is that when you're controlling for these social determinants of health, Black men with prostate cancer had similar or improved outcomes compared with white men with prostate cancer. So what social factors influence prostate cancer outcomes? 
socioeconomical status. There is an increased risk of death associated with lower socioeconomic housing, as well as those with lower education. And this impacts African-American men in that they had a worse survival than non-Hispanic white men. Insurance. Unfortunately, U.S. patients age 18 to 64 years without insurance were more likely to delay or not receive medical care. They were also more likely to have advanced disease at diagnosis and worse survival. In looking at those who are less than 65 years without insurance, it was higher among these following populations. It was higher among Black, American Indian, Alaska Native, and Hispanic compared to white or Asian. It was also higher among people with lower income or education levels or in the South region to not hold insurance. There are other factors to consider, including geography and specific things related to the transgender population. For, for geography, there was a relationship between rural residence, stage, and treatment in the U.S. Those who are non-urban are less likely to receive any treatment, even when stratified by low, intermediate, or high-risk disease. There were also differences in receipt of treatment between urban and rural residents, and this was seen to be the greatest in men with high-risk disease. Transgender population. Cancer stage at diagnosis, treatment, and survival in transgender versus cisgender patients in the U.S. were likely to have poor survival after diagnosis with prostate cancer. For many cancer types, transgender patients may be diagnosed at a later stage, less likely to receive treatment, and this can lead to having worse survival for many types of cancers. There are individual barriers to equitable care in prostate cancer. Personal patient views. 18% of all men in the U.S. do not have a health care provider. One third of men believe that they didn't need annual checkup. In regards to the transgender population, it was reported that one third had experienced negative healthcare related events in the previous year. This may lead to avoiding healthcare settings due to anticipation of mistreatment. Patients may feel undervalued in the healthcare system, embarrassed by their diagnosis, and reluctant to seek help or discuss their disease. There are also some other barriers to consider. There have been reports that the barriers include the inability to get through on a phone line, no appointment availability, long wait times, inconvenient office hours, lack of transportation, and reduced access to higher volume centers. There's also in the U.S. a medical mistrust. Trust in the healthcare among Americans has declined in the recent decades. And it's worse among Black Americans. An October 2020 survey showed that seven out of 10 African American men say they were treated unfairly by the healthcare system, and 55% say they don't trust it. Now that we've discussed and identified barriers and social determinants of health that impact prostate cancer treatment and outcomes, what sort of strategies do we have to improve outcomes in high-risk groups? Community-focused education. Bringing the education to where the patients and the people are. And we can educate community leaders to increase knowledge and advocacy of intentions. We can work with our community leaders to provide prostate cancer screening and education. As mentioned, go where the audience is and where the audience feels comfortable. This may be churches, barbershops, uh, picnics. There's always festivals. So bringing that education in a less threatening environment out to the populations. 
Prostate cancer survivors are excellent sources for educators because they have significantly more appeal with audience than healthcare educators. In terms of the transgender population, Ensuring our clinical practices are welcoming and respectful to all gender identities and expressions. Ask healthcare providers to attend training or skills building workshops to increase understanding and comfort of treating transgender patients. Acknowledge authenticity of transgender individuals' identities, lives, and experiences. And what are ways that we can increase clinical trial participation? We, we should recommend all demographic groups to consider cl clinical trials. We should increase our telehealth appointments to reduce the need to travel to clinical trial appointments. We should consider, where possible, reimbursement of travel expenses. And we should include trial sites with higher percentages of those who have underrepresented patients. Again, going where the patients are, not waiting for them to come to you, training a workforce that resembles the patient population. And again, focusing on prevention, encouraging healthy habits, address misinformation, provide timely follow-up, pay attention to local and psychological well-being, and above and all, listen to our patients. Hi. I'm Steve Friedland, a urologist at Cedars-Sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles, California, as well as the Durham VA Hospital in Durham, North Carolina. It's my privilege to be here today to talk to you about how we can support adherence in prostate cancer treatment and really focus in on the importance of incorporating patient preferences and shared decision-making to ultimately optimize the therapies that our patients receive and ultimately improve outcomes. That's, it's often a question we think about. We, we get data from clinical trials, and the question is, how does that relate to what we see in the real world, and particularly as it relates to adherence to oral prostate cancer treatments? We see in clinical trials, what we see is overall adherence in, in the clinical trials to these medicines, you know, taking an example, whether it's relagolix or luprolide from the HERO trial, really really phenomenal adherence, greater than 99%. And so the question is, what do we see in the real world? You know, you know, where patients aren't as monitored, we give therapies, we're busy, we're talking about other side effects and things. And overall, the adherence is not quite the same as you see in the clinical trials, which is not surprising. And when we look at this, when we look at different therapies, we see that in terms of our patients are getting more than 80% of their medicines is usually a benchmark. So we're not at the 99% we see in clinical trials, just even using an 80% benchmark. Are they taking it 80% of the time? We look at different therapies, apalutamide, enzalutamide, abiraterone. We see numbers running in the, the mid to 80% to low 90%. Um, but if we go to the proportion of days covered where they're above 80%, they were only hitting about 40 to 50%. So we certainly have room to go to improve things. And, you know, the question is, is it different if we're doing an injectable or an oral therapy? There's this idea that while I don't necessarily trust my patients, oral therapies are, are kind of sketchy. Are the patient really going to take it? But injection, you know, that's something I give as the doctor. We're going to have great adherence to that. And it turns out it's actually pretty similar. Um, if we look at non-adherence rates, oral therapies, anywhere from 25 to 50%, which is actually pretty similar to injectables where it's over 25%. And there was a recent study that looked at this in terms of injectables of LHRH um, for patients with prostate cancer. And it showed that 60% of the injections were over a week late and nearly 30% were two weeks late. So we're not necessarily doing as well, even with injectables as we thought we were. And there were specifically some groups that were at high risk for having low adherence. It included black men, older patients, patients who received previous chemotherapy, as well as patients that were having high prescription costs, making it challenging for them to get the medicines. So 
So when we start to think about why are our patients not having optimal, uh, you know, adherence to the medications we recommend, it really comes down to some patient-specific factors and then some challenges just with the medications. Well, let's walk through this for a minute here. So one of the things that, so the patient-specific factors, and this is going to be relevant, this is areas where we can, as providers, help our patients, is sometimes they don't receive enough education about the medicine, how to take it, some of the issues, or certainly physical limitations, sometimes challenges swallowing pills, getting out of bed to take their medicine. They often have cognitive decline. They don't remember to take the medicines. They have high symptom burden, so it's challenging to, to think about medicines they're dealing with their pain, their mobility issues, and there's no care partner available. It certainly helps if they have someone reminding them to take their medicines. And then again, there's often comorbid mental disorders, just make them challenging to remember different things. And then there's some things within medicines themselves. Some this is complex dosing schedules given multiple times a day, um, odd times a day with food, without food. They're often taking many medications, and so it's challenging to try and remember taking all of them. Medications are not cheap in many cases, and so it creates a financial barrier for patients. Mode of administration, again, some people may have problems swallowing, some you know prefer injectables, and then there can be drug-drug interactions where we say, look, you really need this medicine, and the pharmacist says, oh, you've got to be careful of this medicine, and it creates challenges. They don't know whether they should be taking, not, the side effects of not taking it. So there's a lot of barriers to appropriate adherence that we need to be mindful of as we're prescribing these medicines. So that's really the, the key question is that how can we do better? How can we help our patients to improve their adherence? And so again, breaking it down into patient-specific factors, and things we can do to simplify the dosing instructions. So we can have patients develop treatment diaries where they actually write down every time they took their medicine. And they can, you know, look back. Did I take my medicine today? Did I not? We can have automated reminders, text message that goes out, an email, something to remind the patients. We certainly want to be mindful that the patients have family. They have care partners. They have healthcare teams. We want to get those people involved such that you have the, the sons, the daughters, the spouses reminding the patient, hey, did, dad, did you take your medicine today? Um, we want to really embed the medication habits around other activities. So I know for myself, I can only really remember to take my medicines in the morning around my routine, taking a shower, brushing my teeth, I take my medicines. So making it a habit. So they don't have to think about doing it every day. It's just a habit. I do X, I take my medicines. And then we want to put those medicines where they can see them. And so that way they don't forget. But there's some things that we can also do from the physician side is we can reduce treatment complexity, try to maximize once daily dosing as opposed to a four times a day medicine. We can certainly provide educational materials to the patient, including the importance of taking the medicine on a regular basis. We can do web-based treatment decisions aids to again, help them understand Here's the risks of taking the medicine. Here's the risks of not. And why it's important once we collectively decide to go on a medicine, to actually stay on on a regular basis. And then we can use pill boxes. I find those are extremely helpful, both for myself, uh, but also our patients, that they just open the pill box on a Monday morning, they take their pills, and they don't really have to think about it. It just becomes second nature. So that's one of the key things is when we're trying to think about anything we're doing in medicine really these days is using shared decision-making. So what really is shared decision-making? What's well, a process in which decisions are made collaboratively? So it, with trustworthy information provided between the physician care provider and the patients, and we're discussing things together that we start to understand their personal circumstances, their concerns, put things in the context, provide the information that we need, and together come up with a decision. So from an oncology point of view, that we should emphasize the importance of the patient's opinions, discern possible treatment options, and really provide our recommendations. And often in many cases, there's not a clear-cut answer. So here are some options, here are some pros and cons, and really ultimately get to know the patient. And the patient should feel empowered 
it's important to express their opinions, their thoughts and feelings, ask questions, and really convey to the physician, I would prefer X side effect or Y. And then we can start to say, okay, given that, I think this is the better therapy than this one. So there's a lot of decision aids we have in prostate cancer to help do that. Many of them are focused on earlier stage in terms of to treat or not. But that's what using those tools, we can collaboratively come up with decisions. And so there's plenty of experience uh, in prostate cancer in particular where, where decisions are not always so easy. And that's where, again, we need to understand the patient preferences, whether it's fear of needles, travel constraints, particularly um, vulnerable groups, LGBT. QIA plus in terms of their concerns. And so again, using to share decision-making, using decision aids that we can collectively, again, come up with the optimal treatment for this patient who's right in front of me at this time. Really thank you for watching this. And hopefully, you know, we were focused on androgen deprivation therapy and advanced prostate cancer, but I think many of the things we discussed will be applied more broadly. And I hope you enjoyed it and uh, found it useful for you and your patients.